Anderson Silva, it appears that his run has come to an end or has it. Here's what we think we know. He had, it was initially reported that Anderson Silva's fight this weekend against Uriah Hall um, was going to be his last. And then this morning, it was an interview with ESPN's Ariel Hawani where he says, well. Fine Canadian journalist. Uh, where uh, Silva says, uh, it's definitely my last fight in UFC, but it may not be. He goes, we'll see after that. And if you listen to him say it, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but well, it, it just appears that, like, he definitely intends. You listen to that interview, you don't feel like he's done. Ariel did ask him, are they making you retire? What did Silva he say to says, that? No, that no. is not a conversation that happened. They did argue back and forth about, does Silva have one fight left or two fights left on the deal? It seems like there's an additional fight left on the deal after this, Luke. Yet we saw Silva double down twice in this interview and say, you know, this is really just the end of my UFC run. We'll see what happens with the other organizations. Gun to your head, he's 45. Yep. He's 1-6 in six with the one no contest since 2013. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He's faced top competition. Some of those fights, the Bisping fight could have gone other way. Some bad match matchmaking, some injuries, some bullshit against Weidman. That was his fault as far as the whole thing falling apart, right? Yeah. Drug tests, injuries, a little bit of both here in terms of what you look at over the last seven years. Do we see Anderson Silva again after this Uriah Hall fight? Yeah, no doubt about it. Now, where and under what circumstances, that part I cannot say with any degree of certainty. But he did not sound like a man who was at all done. In fact, he was talking about how important it was that he continue, that the fans demanded that he continue, that this was a cause for him, not merely an option that he could go forward with. But here's how I want to frame the conversation, BC. Let's assume for the second that we can say it's his last fight in UFC. Here is his UFC run. He entered the UFC in June 28th of 2006, and this is what he has done since then. He beat Chris Lieben, Rich Franklin, Travis Luter, Nate Marquardt, Rich Franklin again, Dan Henderson, James Irvin, Patrick Cote, I'm going to stop making fingers for it, Talis Lightes, Forrest Griffin, Demi and Maya, Chael Sonnen, Vitor Belfort, Yushin Okami, Chael Sonnen again, and then Stefan Bonner. Now since then, we all know the story, two losses to Chris Weidman, the no contest against Diaz, the loss to Bisping, somewhat controversial. The fill-in against Daniel Cormier last minute doesn't really count a whole he lot. He hurt him. He hurt him to the body. He did hurt him to the body. He did beat Derek Brunson. Uh, he did lost. he really, though? Did he really? Yeah, it was a terrible fight. And then he lost to Adesanya, which was fair, and then he had the injury against Jared Cannonier. Here's what I want to say, though. Yeah. You know, he went into the UFC. By the time he fought uh, Chris Lieben, he went into that fight with a 17-4 and record. He was coming off the Ong Bak win over Tony Frickland in Cage Rage. What can you say about, if this is the end, what can you say about Silva's run in the UFC? Uh, absolutely spectacular. Certainly, without question, a no-brainer, well, Hall of Famer for sure, but no-brainer finalist in this group of three, four, or five who have a legitimate claim at the throne of the greatest of all time. I mean, there's no question about it. The, the, the record for title defenses he had for a long period of time before Demetrius Johnson broke it, the consistency. But I think what separates his legacy for me, Luke, and makes it a little bit unique compared to to George St. Pierre compared to even John Jones. And by the way, it is a little bit of a shame that he didn't get super fights with either of them when you look back at both scenarios in that situation, is that he transcended the sport, yes, but he transcended it in a way of artistry that none of those other guys have. John Jones have come close at times, but Anderson Silva was a freaking video game. Whether your favorite moment is the front kick against Belfort or the ridiculous soul cleansing he did against Forrest Griffin, where it's just like, you know, bing. Do either <laughs> or, or even the one against Bonner. By the way, shout out to Bonner for, for getting full tan, getting the abs, and then juice into the gills for that one for the biggest what, moment of his you, life. Honestly. But uh what you know, whichever of those moments that you pick, Luke, he reached the level where it's not just a Habib or John Jones prime dominance where you're like, find me somebody that can beat him. It's a different thing. It was more like is he going to be able to find a way to beat somebody that I never thought of before, that I never thought I could see in an elite fight, in a dangerous fight against another guy on his level? He would do things that just didn't seem fair, normal, possible. His mastery uh, and control of the moment was something that I don't think really any other UFC fighter, even when McGregor was red hot, really ever reached a level of respect and awe that people had for him. It was Jordan-esque. It was sort of like otherworldly. Nobody's had that, which is why even to this day, with the drug thing, we can talk about that more, with the, the hanging on too long, with this long losing streak, with the everything considered, 
if you still have Anderson Silva as your greatest of all time, what the hell could you say against that? You really can't say anything against it. It's preference at this point. He has ticked every box across the board, and I think he's uniquely different than all those other guys that he's up against. I mean, if we, if we look at the entirety of his UFC run, I don't think you can say it's the best UFC run ever because there's just too many losses here at the end. But if you wanted to go from the debut against Chris Lieben all the way up until the Stefan Bonner fight, you are talking about like, what is it, a 16-fight run, whatever it is it ends up being. That is maybe the best run of that number of fights mm -hmm. any fighter has ever had at any point in MMA history ever. Like, that is how good that is. And to your point, it's not just that he got his hand raised at the end, although that you could make that consideration as well. It was that he redefined what was possible. He inspired your imagination. He was a figure of adoration because of his martial arts creativity and his spirit, the front kick to the face, the Ongbach elbow. That was one of the hardcores because it happened in London at Cage Rage. But, you know, again, the Forrest Griffin one. He had a million of these. And the clinch against uh, Rich Franklin was so frightening and ferocious. Vicious. And then it was always complemented by this sort of, like, Mike Tyson kind of voice a little bit where yeah. he sounded a little bit like a squeaky mouse to a degree. And then he would go in there and do these ferocious things. You know, he made a point, Israel Adesanya, talking about Anderson Silva. It wasn't just that he was creative. It was that here was this skinny black guy who, you know, if you look, you sized him up, okay, he looks like he's in shape, and maybe he's a swimmer or a biker or something. But, you know, you put him next to James Irvin, who's just, you know, muscled up, totally full of tattoos. Most people are going to be like, that dude with the tats is going to fuck him up. And James Irvin had nothing. Here, here, I'll hold the leg and I'll take your yeah, life. Had yeah, had nothing for him. It redefined what was possible through fighting. It redefined what was possible through creativity. And I've made this point before. Habib has done this to the game. There are guys who do things in fights, ladies too, I think Ronda should be credited for this, who do things in fights that seem impossible, and they not only like, make that work, they make it work with the kind of ease that it raises the overall level of the game. People talk about the NFL yeah. being a copycat league because someone's running cover two, blah, blah, blah kind of offense or whatever. And the other teams look and they go, aha, we can do this. Silva came around and showed people there's a higher order to fighting. Follow me if you want to get there. And others will stand on his shoulders, Adesanya, Habib, and the wrestling department. Man, that is a contribution to fighting almost, I'm not sure you could say that about St. Pierre. Did he really redefine the game? He was very good at mastering the components, but he didn't really make, he reimagined who was possible in terms of, oh, do you have to come from a wrestling background to get there? No, you don't. So he, I give him credit for that. But he didn't really redefine the game in the same way that Anderson Silva did through his creativity. And what also makes him different compared to those, and you, and you touched on certain parts of this in this, is that like, he became a, a crossover attraction on a level that no one else really had from just the standpoint of, I want to see him do crazy shit, right? It wasn't even about wins or losses. I mean, it was about, is someone going to be able to give him a problem? But it was more about, I want to see what he does next in there, which is unique to himself. But even though he, he went in there to win, let's make no doubt about it, and even though, Luke, he did have that weird hiccup with uh, Damian Maya where he was sort of acting out and it was a boring fight and all that, he was a guy who didn't look for the easiest way to win. He always looked for the most spectacular. He always looked for the way to elevate what was possible and elevate his game in the moment that was so freaking fan-friendly fan that he reached a level of stardom with barely able, being able to speak English and barely being able to sort of, you know, with that, that, that very soft, effeminate voice almost, that it's pretty badass that he's been able to juggle that and be such a ambassador of the sport, be such a you know proponent of Bushido and sort of carry that out really into his late 30s where he was still super ass elite. And even into this losing streak, he's had some serious moments. I'll throw the Adesanya fight out there. I know you don't necessarily believe that he sort of disarmed Israel of a certain degree, but he came that night, whether it was artificial or not, he came ready for a fight. You were going to have to beat him. And uh, his ability to not necessarily age in that regard is sort of extra special as well. Um, you know, not a trash talk guy. He, he, he was just all about the fans. And that connection to the fans, I fear, though, will, will leave him hanging on way too long. Well, one more note about that before we talk about some of the downside. If you came to the UFC a little bit late or, you know, you just missed the, the, the pre-2006 portion of his career, then you miss the fact that he had this career before the UFC, yes, but he had really interesting moments before the UFC. So the one I would hi highlight is... Uh, two of them. One, he beat Alex Stiebling, which was really important. Stiebling came along in uh, Pride for a time, and he beat a couple of Brazilian guys and then gave himself, I think, the nickname the Brazilian Killer. Boy, they did not like that. 
So they sent Anderson Silva to go fuck him up, and that is exactly what happened along the way. So that, that was one piece. The other piece was he defeated in London uh, Lightning Lee Murray in his prime in 2004. And Lee Murray, man, like everyone knows him as like, oh, he was a guy who fought in MMA who also had, was part of this incredible bank heist. And the bank heist story, BC, as you know, is so huge and so fast and the furious crazy, people can't believe it, they want to know more about it. I understand, but if you can just for a moment divorce that and just ask, well, wait a second, how good was Lightning, Lightning Lee Murray? Yo, he was fucking good. He was very good. And Anderson Silva went into this fight, widely disregarded, and beat the brakes off of Lightning Lee Murray in his hometown without any issue. Had the guy begging for his life near the end of that contest. He did shit like that, and then went to, the, went to Pride, and then went to UFC, and then at UFC, in his 30s, had basically the best run any fighters ever it's had. Crazy. It's fucking ridiculous. It's crazy, and it all, you know, it all seemed to change for him at UFC 182, I'm sorry, 162 against Weidman in that first fight. Uh, you know, the injury happened Seven in the years second ago, fight. Can you believe that? Seven years ago. Was it, was it going to catch up to him anyway? I look back at that first fight and how it went, and it just, to see a guy lose in such a, sort of a bullshit way that's his fault, that's sort of, you know, doing the bullshit thing too much that you shouldn't do and he got caught for it, was it inevitable that it was going to fall apart anyway? Yeah, I mean, I think he was doing a lot of that because he just wasn't feeling it that night. And I think he was just trying to find a way to get him into the fight or get Chris out of the fight. And he just went to the well one too many times. Look, I mean, I one time interviewed Matt Brown before the uh, Wonder Boy fight. This was in Atlanta when um, Rashad fought John Jones. And I asked him, I was like, what do you make about his kickboxing record? He's like, look, I'll be honest with you. I don't know any of these motherfuckers he fought. I don't think anybody does. He goes, but I'll tell you what. And at, the, at the point, I think Wonder Boy had had like a 50 or 60 fight winning streak in kickboxing. He goes, but let me tell you why I respect it. He goes, do you think that all 50 or 60 times that he showed up, that he wasn't injured, that he felt great? that he had a good night of sleep, that he wasn't sick. He goes, there are guaranteed times he went in there feeling like 10% of himself, and he still was able to get the win. He goes, that consistency tells you how good he is. Not the names, but the ability to show up time after time after time. But you can only do that for so long, even if you're the great Anderson Silva. That's what I think. All right, let, let, let's, be, let's be harsh here. Has he hung on too long? Yeah, without question. No doubt about it. Now, he hasn't disgraced himself, but then again, a one in six record in eight fights and injuries and multiple PI, PED situations. He hasn't disgraced himself, great. but you know what he has done, BC? He has helped people forget who he was. He has had a series of boring performances. He had the injuries, which has cost him time, uh, which, you know, to the extent is that his fault, not necessarily, but he's, you know, part of the architect of that. The PED stuff has not helped, I don't think. I don't think it's been super damaging, but it's not helped. Um, and then, you know, age has also been a contributor. And so folks are looking at this fight with Uriah Hall, and they're saying, how competitive it is it? Maybe it'll be something like the Adesanya fight, where he takes a defensive posture that is a little bit hard to unlock. And so it, I think it fools people into thinking how competitive it is. But he did win a round on the judges' scorecards, and so in that sense it kind of was. Or maybe he goes out right and he wins. But there's a, sort of this feeling that, like, however good he was, we're, we've lost that, and we're not going to get it back. And now we just have this dude who's surfing on a resume at this point. Yeah, and uh, let's quickly hit this. We got a lot of hate last week when we did the GOAT debate in light of Habib, uh, you know, retiring unbeaten and who's better, Habib or Jones and all that. And you made a comment that I sort of agreed with you. And look, I, it's taken me a while to get here, but it is that we're not holding the PEDs against some of these guys in the GOAT debate who have PED issues open and blatantly and honestly because you and I both feel like we're at the point the, the, the guys with money are ahead of the testers anyway. The majority of, of opponents these guys fought along the way were probably using anyway. There's a lot of people who are hurt about that. I don't give a fuck. But are hurt on the level of like that's an irresponsible take because of how dangerous it is to go no, in there. It's against... irresponsible to buy into nonsense. Let me tell you how the which camera are we on? I don't. Oh wow! Oh, okay. Hey, here we go. Here we go, guys. It's... No, no, no. Hold on. This is not some like fire and brimstone thing. I'm just I, honestly, I'm trying to reason with people, folks. If you want to be that hardcore about how we include or not folks who have any kind of known or suspected relationship to performance-enhancing drugs, you have to do away with the Hall of Fame altogether. You can't do it. It's not coherently possible. Even if you wanted to say you could start in the USADA era, even then you can't do it. It's not, it's not possible. So if you want to have a Hall of Fame where you honor fighters who competed at the sport in various times, you have to understand that's going to come with 
inextric uh, inex uh, inextricable drug use, even and especially at the elite level. Anderson Silva has, I mean, first of all, he fought in pride. You can just imagine every one of them was on something all the way through. Cage rage, you know, any, anything 2006 and prior, anything pre usada This wasn't legitimate drug testing back then. Unless you took, unless you took nothing to block it and you went in there straight up to a piss yeah. test, you're even, not getting even, caught. Even now, there are tons of ways to get around it. I'm just trying to point out to you, it's not possible to have a Hall of Fame where you honor the history of the sport and then suggest you can have one that's drug free. All of your heroes in MMA most likely have either taken drugs or uh, taken drugs for a, t a, a, a certain amount of time, not the entirety of their career, but a certain amount of time. I mean, he had those two losses to Weidman, but he had the devastating injury, right? I mean, he came back in what, less than a year or about a year or something? I mean, how do you think you can come back? I'm just not going to be naive free? anymore in all sports, but look, I've covered boxing MMA at the highest level, so have you, Luke. We've seen things with our eyes that just like, I mean, things that guys are doing. And the guy went on his best run in his 30s, BC. Do I really think the entirety of that, the entirety of that was drug-free? Of course I don't. I think it's almost getting to the level, and look, this may, you know, anger people, where if you're not doing it, you're not being this smart as you could be to protect yourself knowing how many others are. And maybe, and look, I've just, I've gotten to that point where I'm just not going to believe that everything I see is, is the uppity because somebody didn't pop. I mean, it, right. you know, I've, I've seen enough. When people do pop, they do make a mistake, they do whatever, but... Yeah. Testing uh, is for the donks, and it's, and it's theater for low-information fans. And it hurts to me. I, I know when I say that, people want to dismiss it, and it hurts. But the evidence on this is so clear. I came around. I came around. It's I'm so with you, clear. I'm with you. That is, that is what it is. Your favorite Anderson Silva moment, though. Should this, We don't know. If he gets knocked out by Hall on Saturday, maybe we don't see him again. What's your favorite moment? I'll tell you what. So I had a guy. He uh, Let me give a shout-out if I can. He's one of the hosts of the Midday Show in D.C., on uh, 106.7 The Fan, his name is Danny Ruye. Oh, I thought you were gonna hit my guy Chad Dukes, love that guy. Uh, well, so, so, so Chad Dukes follows Danny Ruye and Grant Paulson on the, on the channel, shouts to Chad as well. But Chad was already a, uh, a, an MMA fan. Mm -hmm. And I remember Danny and I had uh, sparked a relationship and Danny was like, I wanna watch MMA. So will you teach me how to watch MMA? Will you show me some? So I said, sure enough. I said, why don't you come over? And this was the fight against Vitor Belfort. Whew. And he had heard about Anderson Silva. He had heard all the good things. And then Silva went in there and front kicked him in the face. There is no greater, like, this. nothing is worse, BC, than when you talk someone up about MMA, or a fighter in particular, and it just shits the bed. Oh, you gotta see Maypac. It's gonna be the best yeah. fight of the century. <laughs> exactly, it's the worst. But nothing is sweeter, nothing is sweeter than when you have a casual sports, sorry, a casual MMA fan, but a hardcore sports fan, who's willing at this one time to give MMA a look, and Anderson Silva fucking front kicks Vitor Belfort in the face. The payoff to this day, every time I see the guy, he always is like, is Anderson Silva still front kicking people in the face? I'm like, no, but I'm glad you remember that day. I, I gotta go with the Forrest Griffin moment. There's never been a moment in MMA where I can't stop giggling because I just feel like, like he just f somebody up such at such an embarrassing. No wonder, and I shout out to Forrest Griffin, a Hall of Famer. No wonder he got up and ran out of the cage in Philly and was like, "I ain't," um, you know. It was very Caveman Rickles against MVP, by the way. Yeah, it was it just was. sort of like, "I'm not no moss. I ain't dealing with this shit." He reached a level, Luke, of sorcery in that moment. Okay, maybe Griffin slow enough to always be a, a a guy he could do that too. But he moved up to a five against a former champion. It wasn't a you know a gimme. And to make it look like when you're playing video games against your young child and you're just like, watch the, I mean, the, the, the gambles that Silva could take at the elite level and pull it off was magic. That magic is rare in the fight game for somebody to do that at that level. That encapsulates everything I love about him. Thank you, Andy. 15 years ago, you made your pay-per-view debut as a headliner against Arturo Gatti. Are there any similarities in your eyes to where Tank's brand is now to where you were entering the Gatti fight? I believe in Tank. When Tank was very, very young, I told him someday he will be fighting on pay-per-view. And now we're here. I've been doing it for so long. I started fighting when I was eight. I'm made for this. You know, I'm here for a reason. I'm in the best shape of my life. As we know, we have a hard fight. I think the hardest fight in my career. There's a big opportunity for me to become a pay-per-view superstar, and that's what I want. A couple years ago when I was saying I was going to be the next pay-per-view star, people were thinking that I was just talking. Now that it's really here, I'm on the road to be a superstar.
TV taught me how to dream. It was a life jacket. I don't think you can be an artist and not touch people.